So the topic we'll be discussing today is basically a little bit of poetic one. So it's how we are going to light up images in the deep learning era. So I opened up this PowerPoint presentation, but we won't be using it or following it up. So we will be using this particular link. You can open it up yourself. Uh, this link will lead you to a weights and biases report, uh, which consists uh, contains all the materials. So there was a question if I'm going to share any of the materials or not, you have it there. So let's get started. So before delving right into how we are going to light up images using deep learning, let's uh, talk a little bit about myself. I, uh, I am a machine learning engineer at Weights and Biases. I am also a Google developer expert in JAX. I have worked for Ignitarium, uh, IBM India, and DeepRex AI previously as machine learning engineers as so and software developer roles. And uh, I won't be uh, uh, droning on more about this. I'll only be pointing out two things that currently I'm working on Restorers, which is a, a toolkit for uh, which provides out of, uh, out of the box implementations for SOTA image and video restoration uh, models and uh, APIs for training and evaluating them. And I'm also uh, working on uh, weights and biases callbacks for Keras, which are basically Keras callbacks, which uh, provides you with an interface for performing experiment tracking, model checkpointing, data evaluation, model surgery, mo uh, data visualization, and a lot of good things with your Keras-based machine learning workflows. So I'll go back to the actual uh, material and we will start uh, right up. So why do we need uh, to even light up images? Uh, with or without deep learning. So images, as we know, are often taken under, you know, a lot of suboptimal uh, lighting conditions, which may include something like uh, uneven light, dim light, or even uh, if you can see uh, cases like this, where uh, even though there's uh, some light in the image, the subject uh, has the light uh, facing uh, their backwards. So the camera doesn't uh, capture any details of the subject. There might be multicolored lights, which uh, make it difficult for us to perform a uh, high level of uh, computer vision tasks on a particular image. Uh, some images might be poorly lit just because of bad cinematography, because uh, I don't know if you remember uh, this scene from uh, this famous show called Game of Thrones. So uh, we have had our uh, pain points regarding this. Uh, but why do we need to light them up? Just Is it just because of the aesthetics? Turns out that such poorly lit images uh, suffer a lot from, uh, you know, uh, 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 not only just compromised aesthetic quality, but uh, performing high level computer vision tasks like, uh, like object detection, uh, object recognition, and uh, uh, image segmentation and other uh, operations on such poorly lit images is actually pretty difficult. So here, basically, we are showing uh, two weave panels. Uh, in the first weave panel, we have two images which are uh, lit extremely poorly. And uh, we apply uh, the SOTA, the most state-of-the-art uh, object detection uh, model that's available to us, uh, YOLO V8 large. And you can see that it detects only five objects. Uh, and um, then basically we apply some kind of image, rest uh, I won't say restoration, I would say low light enhancement uh, uh, models on top of these images and then apply uh, YOLO V8. And you can see dramatically the number of objects being detected shoot up. So from five, it goes to 16, and from one, it starts detecting eight objects right away. So uh, by the way, just uh, uh, for the sake of showing you, uh, you can actually uh, play with uh, these uh, images and uh, these interface. Uh, Weights and Biases provides us with this particular interface for playing with your object detection annotations. So there's that. And uh, uh, so uh, we kind of uh, got an idea of why low light enhancement is necessary. Uh, we will, uh, you know, briefly glance over some potential applications of low light enhancement, which include uh, visual surveillance, uh, autonomous driving, as you saw right now, uh, computational photography, especially uh, photography on edge devices uh, or smartphones. So this is uh, a particular uh, video uh, that was created by Shai Paul, in which uh, he basically runs this particular uh, low light enhancement model uh, in real time in a smartphone. And he is basically using it as a night vision system on his smartphone. 
real time uh, night vision system on his uh, smartphone so yeah so these models are actually pretty cool i would say uh, then basically let's move to the next section which is discussing uh, briefly the traditional methods of low light enhancement so uh, traditionally low light enhancement methods before the deep learning era used to be uh, mostly based upon broadly upon these two methods which are histogram equalization and retinx models so in histo histogram uh, equalization basically is a technique where uh, you uh, calculate the image histogram and then uh, calculate its uh, cdf uh, and then basically use that cdf to uh, redistribute the values of the pixel to uh, pixels of the image to uh, redistribute their intensity values of each pixel uh, to increase the overall contrast of the image and uh, retinx models are kind of uh, a little more simpler in the sense that they use the retinx theory of uh, color vision uh, and use uh, uh, these uh, particular models basically decompose a given low light image into a reflection uh, component and an illumination component uh, by priors uh, or regular uh, regularizations or uh, similar approaches uh, so and, and and the estimated uh, reflection component is basically given to us as the enhanced enhanced uh, image but uh, um, you know these approaches these traditional approaches has their fair share of disadvantages uh, so uh, i won't uh, you know talk a lot about unrealistic enhancement because uh, even state of the art deep learning models sometimes uh, gives us unrealistic enhancements they might overexpose the image or uh, even under uh, underexpose the image overexpose a certain part of the image and un underexpose a certain part of the image so uh, unrealistic enhancement i won't really uh, classify it as a problem that's specific to traditional uh, methods for low light enhancements, rather it's a, a universal problem. But these three are actually pretty crucial in the sense that uh, if your image uh, has already some noise present in it, the noise actually gets completely ignored by these uh, methods, which may lead to uh, the noise uh, remaining as it is. And when the contrast of your image increases, increases the noise uh, often blows up kind of the intensity of the noise is uh, uh, often increase uh, the computational uh, complexity of such uh, models is another uh, question because they use archaic um, uh, you know uh, uh, optimization techniques uh, which take a lot of time uh, to run and is uh, kind of not suitable for uh, real uh, uh, real time applications like we saw uh, just now and uh, you know, uh, it, they require a lot of manual tweaks to be able to uh, uh, to be able to uh, account for a lot of edge cases. Uh, like uh, if if your images have especially sharp edges uh, with respect to the intensity of the pixels, uh, it uh, requires uh, these mo models, the parameters of these models, to be tweaked manually to suit that particular image. Now that we have, you know, kind of uh, talked a little bit about traditional methods for low light enhancement, we will see what the deep learning era brings, kind of. So uh, this here is basically a timeline of uh, uh, the deep learning explosion in uh, in the domain of uh, low light enhancements in particular and uh, deep learning based image restoration in general. So. Uh, this uh, particular paper called LLNet, it uh, came out in uh, 2017 and um, uh, it, was, uh, it, uh, it was basically called Low Light uh, Network, uh, which was basically a deep autoencoder based model for uh, low light enhancement. And since then, uh, each and every year, we have got uh, gotten some amazing uh, papers uh, for, uh, for solving problems in this particular domain. And uh, among all these papers, Today, in this particular presentation, we will be discussing about three particular methods. One of them is MeNet v2, uh, the other one is NAFNet, and uh, the other one is 0DC uh, from all the way back in 2020. So let's, let's kind of get started as to how basically we can train these kind of models, uh, because you know training models is not that easy. So uh, here, I'm actually quite happy to share with everyone that uh, we have been working on this particular tool, uh, which is open source and written using TensorFlow and uh, Keras. Uh, the tool is called Restorers. It's basically an ongoing effort to 
uh, compile implementations of various uh, state of the art image restoration techniques not just limited to low light enhancement but initially uh, we are actually focusing on low light enhancement so what you can uh, get out of this particular library you uh, can get well documented implementations of all the methods we will be discussing today uh, using tensorflow and keras and uh, restorers also provides you uh, very easy to use apis for training inference and benchmarking such kind of models we are also uh, implementing a lot of uh, 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 tasks not just uh, you know low light enhance enhancement so in future we are going to be focusing on uh, super resolution uh, de-raining de-blurring defocus de-blurring denoising and all kinds of image restoration based techniques so um, without further delay let's let's kind of get started you can you know use uh, restorers you can just install restorers using uh, uh, pip install from our Git, uh, github repository uh, for the complete code, uh, you know, we have the collab uh, linked uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, particular report. You can check out the example uh, collab notebooks, which shows you how to train each and every models that we will be discussing today. We will uh, be also sharing code to uh, perform inference and evaluate the performance of uh, such models on one particular benchmark. So since we are also going to be evaluating this uh, these models let's take a look at our data set because uh, this is uh, this is the data set that we will kind of be training and uh, you know uh, training our model on and and uh, uh, we will be evaluating our model on this particular data set also uh, the, so uh, the data set is called lol data set or low light uh, paired image data set uh, you can find the original sources here we have posted this data set as a uh, as a weights and biases artifact, uh, uh, which you can see in this particular weave panel. And using this particular artifact is very easy. You can go to the usage tab and you can just see the code uh, that uh, that you need to kind of fetch this data set under a weights and biases uh, run so that your lineage is tracked uh, under this particular column. Uh, and you can also explore the files here. And uh, let's you know see how we can build an input pipeline on this particular data set using restorers so it's actually pretty easy uh, you see uh, all we need to do is import the corresponding data loader for, from restorers and we have to instantiate the data loaders uh, you we just saw that uh, in the usage tab of this particular uh, uh, data set uh, we have this particular artifacts artifact address we can just copy and paste it uh, to the dataset artifact uh, address um, uh, 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 parameter in the lol data loader, and uh, we can simply call uh, data data loader dot get datasets on this particular data loader, and bam, we get the train and test data, uh, uh, train and validation datasets, which uh, basically uh, are TensorFlow dataset objects, which we can uh, easily use to train. Uh, uh, model uh, in a keras based workflow and uh, the best thing about this uh, particular data loader is that if you choose this particular uh, field if you set it to true you can actually uh, get this uh, your whole data set logged as a weights and biases table uh, right away in your weights and biases uh, uh, workspace so uh, I'll, I'll quickly show you uh, a very interesting thing about how, why you sh uh, should actually care about logging it as uh, a weights and biases table. Uh, uh, you let's remove this particular column, and if if I click on split and select group by, you can actually group by the data set, uh, group the data set by the corresponding splits, which consist of train validation and test. So you can kind of already get an idea uh, explode the images from here uh, as you can see like there are uh, 388 uh, images we will be using for training uh, not 388 images rather 388 image pairs we will be using for training uh, we will be using 97 images uh, image pairs for validation and 15 image pairs for testing so uh, yeah so uh, uh, we can get this feature out of the box uh, using restorers and uh, just by setting this particular flag to true. Now uh, let's take an uh, take a look at uh, one of the uh, one of the models we uh, uh, talked about earlier, uh, which is MeanNet V2. So MeanNet V2 was proposed uh, by this paper last year uh, uh, 
uh, which was called learning enriched features for fast image restoration and enhancement. So MeNet V2 is basically a fully convolution ar architecture uh, for supervised uh, learning of uh, low light enhancement uh, task, uh, task. And it's a it's uh, not uh, not a model that's uh, that has been specifically applied to low light enhancement. It has been uh, it's it acts as a, a standard bench uh, standard baseline for image restoration, uh, and this particular architecture can in turn be used for other restoration tasks like denoising, uh, defocus, deblurring, deraining, defogging, and uh, denoising. Uh, also, super resolution. So, uh, we'll uh, briefly glance over the you know main uh, features of MinetV2. So. The heart of the MirNet V2 is basically uh, these multi-scale uh, residual blocks. So uh, you can understand uh, by multi-scale, it means that the features are uh, kind of uh, processed in this particular block uh, in multiple spatial resolution, multiple uh, values of, values of uh, spatial resolution. And uh, the word residual is uh, very uh, clear that it has some kind of skip connections. Uh, so we will take a look why. So the main branch of the multi-scale residual blocks, which we will be referring to as MRVs, is basically dedicated to maintaining spatially precise high resolution representations of the image throughout the entire network. So uh, unlike an autoencoder, which you know, uh, kind of uh, downgrades uh, your feature a lot and uh, you know, compresses it into a very small latent uh, dimension, uh, the multi-scale uh, residual uh, block uh, ensures that uh, the uh, degradations done to the image or the information that is being lost in the image while uh, forward propagation is happening is minimal. And also the complementary set of parallel branches, because it's a, a residual block, there are uh, multiple parallel branches. So the parallel branches basically make sure that the input and the output of these uh, blocks are uh, better uh, uh, contextualized in terms of each other. These multi-scale residual blocks basically make up the RRG, RRG blocks, which uh, are basically recursive residual blocks, which uh, basically um, form the core building blocks of uh, mean V2, as you can see here. Uh, so yeah, so uh, it seems like mean V2 is quite a complex architecture, right? So if uh, you you do not uh, want to uh, uh, you you uh, Kind of want an out of the box implementation of this uh, particular architecture. You can get it uh, out of the box uh, using just a few lines uh, from Restrus. It's actually just one line. I just wrote it in multiple lines for the sake of documenting well. So you can just Im uh, import MeNet V2 uh, model from Restrus.model. And if you instantiate it, you will instant instantly get a tf.keras.model, which you can train, which you can perform inference on, and you can do anything you uh, want with it. Uh, so also, if you want to know how in details uh, of how MinNet V2 and architecture similar to MinNet uh, V2, uh, like since I'm calling it V2, there has to be a V1, right? So the original MinNet. So if you uh, want to know about uh, this particular architecture in further detail, you can actually visit uh, the corresponding tutorial which I uh, authored on keras.io. So, and also if you want to, again, uh, uh, check the code of how to use Restorers to train your own uh, low light enhancement model using MinNet V2, you can check out this particular collab. The link is here. So now that we have the model, uh, let's take a look at the loss function. So we are uh, basically gonna use a uh, charbonial loss, which is also called Huber loss uh, in some uh, 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 deep learning uh, literature. So the loss is actually pretty simple. So, uh, so, uh, even uh, even the imp implementation of this particular loss function is uh, present as part of restorers and you can just uh, use it out of the box. Uh, so uh, charbonial loss, why we are using it? Uh, charbonial loss function is actually used a lot in uh, low light enhancement uh, literature uh, all over it, in fact, because it's very much uh, robust to outliers and can handle large target errors between input and output images, which is not possible uh, using standard mean uh, absolute error. Uh, so, and as we can, uh, as we have already mentioned, that L1 and L2 loss uh, basically perform poorly in terms of uh, detecting outliers or handling uh, large differences. So. Basically, you you can call it like a smooth version of an L two loss uh, if you if you want to call uh, call it that. So yeah. Uh, so 
now that we have our loss uh, figured out, our model figured out, our input pipe pipeline figured out, we can just simply put it into a Keras-based workflow and just train it, right? We can just uh, call model.fit, but we will do a few more things uh, before calling model.fit uh, on uh, these images. And we'll be taking a moment to talk about uh, the weights and biases callbacks for Keras and why they are awesome. So uh, the weights and biases callbacks uh, for Keras uh, are uh, awesome in the sense that they, uh, when they are included in your uh, Keras uh, training workflow, they automatically track your metrics, uh, in, including your losses, your uh, your uh, uh, your metrics, uh, which in this case are peak signal to noise ratio and structural similarity for uh, low light enhancement. Uh, it tracks all the usage metrics for your CPU, GPU, TPU even, if you are using TPUs. It automatically tracks the learning rate uh, during your workflow. If, 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 if it's a fixed learning rate, then also it's tracked. If it's a variable learning rate, uh, if you are using a learning rate scheduler, then also it's tracked. Uh, so that way it's useful. So, and the 1D model checkpoint is uh, actually a pretty interesting uh, in the sense it's uh, very similar to the Keras uh, model checkpoint, uh, the vanilla Keras model checkpoint callback. Uh, the difference is that uh, a 1DB model checkpoint callback, uh, if you use it instead of the vanilla Keras model checkpoint callback, 1DB model checkpoint callback automatically syncs your uh, model checkpoints at the end of each epoch, or if, if you define a custom uh, period to save it. Uh, it is automatically synced uh, with your 1db dashboard and it's uh, they are saved as the uh, as different versions of uh, our weights and biases art artifacts artifact so uh, we can see now that we are uh, uh, you know importing the matrix from restorers and we uh, import the callbacks from uh, weights and biases uh, and we compile using the matrix and the optimizer and the loss we use uh, define the callbacks and bam we call model.fit that's it that's not going to train our model and i'm going to show you how it uh, will look up on your racing biases dashboard so as you can see the 1db model uh, 1db matrix logger callback actually tracks your uh, tracks your matrix in a both batch wise as well as in a uh, in an epoch wise manner so uh, uh, these uh, these uh, matrix are tracked uh, batch wise. These matrix have been tracked epoch wise, and you can actually track if your uh, workflow is actually uh, utilizing your uh, GPU to the fullest ex extent during uh, uh, during your uh, training workflow or not. So uh, these are pretty interesting things to track. Uh, and uh, I'm going to briefly show you uh, the model checkpoint. Uh, 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 the out, uh, results of the model checkpoint callback. So uh, as you can see that we uh, actually performed two uh, training experiments with respect to mean and V2, one with uh, uh, resolu uh, props of uh, image crops of resolution 256 by 256, one with uh, resolution 128 by 128. So uh, we have two artifacts here, uh, which are shown by these two beef panels. Um, and if you want to use this particular uh, uh, models in future, uh, once you have completed your training for uh, you know inference or for evaluation, you can simply use uh, you know this particular code to uh, download your artifact. And uh, uh, if you explore the files, you can see that uh, these are actually uh, uh, saved as uh, TensorFlow save model format. And uh, if you uh, go to this particular tab version, you can see you can uh, get the uh, get the uh, particular uh, checkpoint for any epoch, uh, uh, all for all the epochs that we trained our model for. So if we say uh, let's say if we think our model has kind of overfitted after uh, epoch seventy, uh, after epoch seventy, we can just go back to epoch seventy, and uh, in the usage tab we will get the code for downloading that particular checkpoint. So yeah, so the weights and biases uh, callbacks are indeed pretty useful for your uh, machine learning workflow. Now that we have uh, trained the model on uh, uh, mean and V2, uh, uh, the question comes, are we going to see some uh, uh, outputs uh, with respect to this particular uh, model? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, we will. We have uh, two sections uh, which, dedic uh, which are dedicated to evaluation and inference of these particular models. So before that, we will uh, briefly touch over the other two models as well, uh, which are NAFNET and ZeroDC. So NAFNET is actually a pretty 
interesting architecture in the sense that it doesn't use any nonlinear activation uh, function. So the NAF in NAFNet actually uh, stands for nonlinear activation free network. And it is one of the, uh, it was, in fact, I, I won't say it is, but it was last year when it came out, it was uh, one of the uh, state of the art uh, uh, architecture in terms of image restoration. And uh, uh, the funny thing is that the authors of this particular uh, paper actually didn't uh, train uh, NAFNET on uh, any low light enhancement tasks, but we still, uh, you know, uh, use it for a low light enhancement tasks. And we will see kind of how it fares with respect to the other uh, models uh, on this uh, report. So compared to, uh, you know, uh, the uh, multi-scale uh, architecture of uh, mean NetV2, we can see that uh, NAFNET kind of adapts a much more simpler architecture, which is a classic uh, single stage unit-like architecture, as you can see this one. And uh, the authors basically perform a lot of uh, experiments uh, and ablation studies in order to figure out uh, what what features of uh, what uh, whatever we have learned from the whole history of uh, image restoration literature, what works and what doesn't work. So they uh, uh, the authors basically uh, try uh, uh, adopting batch normalization and inst instance normalization, but uh, they find out that batch normalization kind of uh, you know doesn't work for. Uh, uh, smaller batch sizes. And if you want to uh, know why this happens, you can check out this particular paper, which I have linked. Uh, uh, they introduce uh, a lot of unstable statistics uh, when uh, being trained uh, for smaller batch sizes. Um, uh, and uh, then they basically uh, tried instance normalization uh, because as you know, instance normalization is actually pretty good for uh, small batch sizes, but uh, instance normalization was noted that uh, it doesn't always uh, boost the performance uh, of the model uh, significantly and also requires a lot of manual fine tuning. So basically the authors end up favoring uh, layer, normal, uh, layer normalization is in these particular blocks, which they call the NAF block, the nonlinear activation free blocks. So uh, uh, yeah, so basically thus they conclude that layer normalizations are the best uh, active, uh, best normalization technique for in this particular scenario. So, uh, and uh, it, it's also noted that uh, layer normalization uh, makes training of such models a uh, lot smoother compared to batch normalization or instance normalization. And uh, in the sense that uh, they can handle a lot, uh, uh, a quite large learning rate. Uh, uh, and, and since we can train these models uh, that use layer normalization with larger learning rates, we can make the model converge faster, which is always convenient. So now the question comes that, uh, you know, since they're not using activation functions, any kind of nonlinear activation functions, what are they using in uh, their place? So the answer actually is this particular block, which is which the authors of this paper called simple gate. It's actually, uh, inspired by GLU, which is called gated linear unit, which was proposed by, a, a, which was actually a product of the natural language processing uh, literature, not even, uh, it, it doesn't even originate in the computer vision literature. So it's it's pretty interesting, like how uh, NLP, when it uh, when uh, GLU came out in 2016, how it basically inspired the authors in 2022 to adopt this for a novel computer vision uh, uh, task. So that's pretty amazing. So as you can see, uh, that simple gate is actually uh, pretty simple. Uh, you have this particular, uh, you have two, uh, 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 you know, a uh, feature map, which you basically divide into two feature maps uh, by their channels, and you multiply them in an element-wise uh, manner to produce the next feature map. So, uh, so uh, this is this is how basically simple gate works. Uh, and this particular uh, simple gate is used in places of uh, uh, you know, nonlinear activation functions for the NAP blocks in the uh, NAFNet model. And as usual, as we saw for the case of uh, uh, MINET V2, that uh, it's it's actually also uh, very simple to uh, get your NAFNet. Uh, it's implemented as part of rest restorers, and uh, uh, and you can actually get it here. I would uh, uh, point your attention to one particular place in this code snippet is that uh, middle block number, which is actually the number of NAF blocks we will be using for this particular experiment has actually been set into one. So uh, this is interesting uh, because the authors actually use 36 NAF blocks for in their uh, in their paper for uh, training uh, their models, which achieve SOTA results. 
they obviously trained on very large uh, and diverse data sets uh, for tasks other than low light enhancement. But uh, for the scope of this particular report, we uh, decided to stick to only one NAF block uh, in this whole uh, NAFnet uh, model. So we will be training. And, uh, you know, for training uh, NAFnet, uh, you can actually check out the code again in this particular collab. For uh, training NAFNET, we basically use the same input pipeline and the training workflow we used for MinNet V2 because they are essentially similar problems in the in the sense that they are uh, uh, they are supervised low light enhancement uh, tasks. So the whole workflow doesn't change. All we do is in the training workflow of MinNet V2, we just take out the MinNet V2 and we just put in uh, the NAFNET model, and uh, we can see that uh, right from the uh, uh, results we received for MeNet V2, uh, the landscape of the metrics is actually way smoother for uh, way smoother for NAFNet. And as we can see, they actually converge a lot faster. Uh, like they just converge after uh, a thousand steps. Uh, uh, whereas like, you know, if you see in MeNet V2, like they took almost uh, 10 times as, as many steps to converge. So yeah, so so and and also as you can see, like uh, uh, the GPU usage is the GPU power usage for training an, an FNet is is actually significantly low compared to Minet V two, uh, which we can see is a lot. Uh, this this actually uh, uh, raises an interesting question, like. Should we use? Uh, should we try using uh, NAFNET uh, for for a lot of real time cases because it's more eco friendly? Maybe, but we will also have to take a look at uh, the performance with respect to uh, inference and the evaluation benchmarks. So now we have kind of you know like covered uh, training NAFNET. We will take a look at this really interesting model called uh, Zero DC, which is zero reference deep curve est estimation uh, for low light enhancement. And the most interesting thing about this model is like uh, uh, the previous two models we discussed, uh, MINET V2 and uh, NAFNET, they are both supervised model in the uh, models in the sense that they require paired supervision. They require a ground truth to uh, compare the loss against. However, this paradigm of uh, uh, training low light enhancement models is actually difficult because it's actually difficult to gather uh, such uh, large and diverse data sets uh, which are paired. So, in that respect, zero DC is actually pretty useful and interesting to look at. And let us see basically how they uh, formulate the problem of low light enhancement uh, in uh, in a clever way uh, so as to avoid pair supervision. So uh, zero DC basically makes use of uh, something called a deep curve uh, estimation network, which uh, we will check here DC in it. And they basically uh, formulate the low light enhancement problem as a task of estimating image specific tonal curves uh, in deep neural networks and the authors specifically uh, authors of zero dc actually took inspiration from uh, curve adjusting in uh, photoshop to basically train a model to do the same in an uh, in a zero shot manner so what basically light estimation curves are that uh, they basically are a kind of curve that can map a low light image to its enhanced version automatically and uh, these uh, self-adaptive uh, curve parameters are solely dependent on the input image and not a ground truth to compare against. So this is basically a conceptual uh, diagram of zero DC and it's taken from the paper itself. And before jumping into how we can use this or how we can train this, uh, we will uh, briefly take a look at uh, this particular component, which is the DC net, which is basically the heart of zero DC. It's a very small and lightweight uh, neural network, uh, which consists of, you know, like eight layers. Uh, and it, it's, um, it looks uh, like a little unit, you can say. And this particular model actually predicts the 24 curve parameter ma maps, which are then iterate, uh, applied uh, iteratively over each other uh, to uh, eight times to get basically uh, this particular enhanced image. Now you can actually play with this particular number. You can use 16 iterations in terms of eight. Uh, eight. You can use uh, less, you can try using more, but we uh, found that eight iterations is basically the sweet spot where we are getting the best results in terms of uh, you know the uh, trade-off with respect to the uh, G-flops of the model. So uh, uh, before we 
uh, take a look uh, before we train the model and take a look at the uh, matrix we will uh, you know try to briefly glance over uh, the non reference loss functions which zero dc uses uh, so the non reference loss functions are interesting because unlike the charbonial loss it doesn't basically uh, they do, uh, doesn't basically need uh, a ground truth to be compared against so basically these are a set of differentiable non reference losses that basically allows us to evaluate uh, intrins the intrinsic quality of the enhanced images. Uh, so what are these intrinsic qualities that we want to check? We want to check for color constancy. We want to check for exposure control. We want to check if the illumination smoothness over the uh, illumination is smooth across the image and is not janky. Uh, we want to check if the constant uh, constancy of the illumination and the uh, overall contrast in the enhanced image is uh, consistent over across its partial dimensions. So that's why basically we use this particular, these four particular um, uh, non-reference loss functions. And uh, all of these functions are actually, uh, loss functions are actually implemented as part of the zero DC model. All you need to do is just, you know, define the zero DC model, uh, which you can uh, do here. Uh, you can do here, you can just, uh, again uh, use it as part of restorers and uh, you just need to compile it uh, and notice that while compiling basically we uh, define how much weightage we basically want to give to each particular uh, uh, loss and uh, you can see like uh, the amount of weightage we want to give to exposure loss or color constancy loss or illumination smoothness loss and these default values that you can see here are actually in fact taken from the paper itself so we actually haven't played a lot with these particular values uh, a lot more experiment uh, uh, remains to be done if we can tweak these values to improve the performance of this particular model or not and uh, if we see uh, the training matrix for uh, these particular models uh, we can see that they are actually quite stochastic like uh, note one thing that we are not actually looking at uh, peak signal to noise ratio or anything like that. We are just looking at the non-reference loss functions and, uh, you know, some uh, kind of smoothing has been applied to this particular uh, uh, landscapes, uh, loss landscapes to uh, make them presentable or even, you know, to make them make sense out of them. So, uh, yeah, so that's the case of training zero DC. So now kind of we have seen how we can train our low light enhancement models. Let's uh, see how we can evaluate our uh, low light enhancement model on a benchmark we ourselves have, have uh, uh, defined. So you can actually uh, define this particular evaluator for LOL data set from restorers uh, in order to do so. And uh, what it does is uh, you just have to uh, define the evaluator you have to particularly initialize the model you want to uh, use from a weights and biases artifact. If you do not want to use a model from weights and biases artifact, uh, you can simply pass your model in the constructor right here. And then just call evaluate. And let's see basically what insight it uh, kind of gives us. So as we can see, we uh, are evaluating like the performance on the training and validation set is not that uh, important. So we will kind of ignore it. Let's see on the eval 15, the test data, how it's performing. And as you can see that in terms of inference time, NAFNIC beats all the models. And this is uh, pretty interesting because NAFNIC also has the best performance in terms of peak signal to noise ratio and almost the best performance in terms of structural similarity. So NAFNIC being the fastest of all these models, is kind of also seems to be uh, the better performant in terms of uh, uh, in terms of peak signal to noise ratio and uh, structural similarity. So it might seem to us that uh, you know, like it might be a good idea to stop all low light enhancement uh, research uh, at this point and you know just adopt NAFNET or uh, adopt ideas from for NAFNET. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, 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 evidence that we could do that, but. Uh, we won't just hold on. I'll show you why we shouldn't. So as you can see, in terms of the number of parameters and the number of trainable parameters, also NAFNET is quite reasonable, uh, with, especially with respect to mean V2. Uh, even though zero DC gives us really the smallest models, like uh, in terms of G flops, uh, NAFNET is pretty slim. It's so slim that you have to zoom in this chart to actually even see that it's uh, the number of G, G flops uh, this particular model has. 
and uh, the restorers evaluator basically logs this particular uh, table also, which uh, uh, logs uh, the performance of each model across all these particular uh, 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 splits. So if we group by this particular split, uh, we can kind of uh, see the tendencies of uh, these models, the skewness of uh, the uh, inference time and the matrix uh, with respect to each and every uh, model. So yeah, that's, uh, so it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. And you can, uh, in fact, use the code here, or you can, uh, you know, just run the collab here to see how the evaluator works or play with it. But now comes the real fun part. So we will perform inference on uh, these models and we will uh, check a few cool use cases. Uh, and uh, let's see a few of them. So we have uh, some really, uh, poorly uh, lit images and we can see the performance of these models and uh, one interesting thing is that uh, let's uh, we uh, kind of uh, fixated there last time on nafnet uh, during the evaluation phase right so let's see how only uh, the performance of nafnet only so let's set the uh, model alias to just nafnet 256 and apply so that we have filtered out all the performances and you can see they are actually pretty good, uh, right? They are they are actually pretty good. So if you if you actually see this particular image, you you cannot make out anything. The contrast is so low. The details are there, but the contrasts themselves are so low that you can you cannot make out anything. But voila, by some magic, Nafnet has you know produced this great image. But I would point you out to the, uh, a few things like uh, NAFNET also introduces these weird artifacts in your uh, image. And uh, as we have seen that uh, we could potentially use low light enhancement models for, as pre-processing step, uh, steps for uh, object detection models, uh, it's uh, not uh, suitable for such kind of artifacts to remain. So we kind of have, you know, have dismissed mainnet v2, right? Because it's too slow, too large of a model. Let's see, uh, however, uh, how zero DC uh, fares against this particular challenge. And as we can see for the same image, such kind of artifacts are actually non-existent. And the image is also kind of not overexposed and more, better, you know, in terms of visual quality, it's better to look at. So you can uh, explore a couple of these uh, examples, you know, from time to time, uh, you know, even zero DC gives you overexposed results. And uh, we could actually solve this by training the model on larger and more diverse data sets, which uh, feature more diverse illumination conditions compared to the LOL data set, uh, and it should fix the problem. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, like I actually tried it on a couple of images from those traded Game of Thrones episodes also, and it looks pretty nice. And uh, the best thing uh, about uh, Zero DC is, uh, as we saw in the evaluation section, is uh, how 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 small number of trainable parameters uh, there are. So it's actually pretty easier to train. And if we go back to the training portion where we have the artifacts for Zero DC, uh, if you check, uh, let this load. If you check the size of the model, it's less than one MB, which makes it the probably the best candidate to be applied for a low light enhancement uh, 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 model in terms of uh, a pre-processing step for high level image uh, uh, or computer vision tasks. So yeah, so. Zero DC coupled with the fact that it doesn't require paired supervision, uh, it provides uh, not uh, visually pleasing looking uh, images that are visually pleasing looking. Uh, looking, it doesn't uh, require a lot of data to train. It it can be trained faster. That kind of makes zero DC one of the most desirable models to be taken into production in such kind of scenarios. So, yeah. So, uh, even though NAFNET is cool, zero DC kind of uh, you know performs better on uh, lots of diverse images, it seems like that. And I'll uh, briefly point you out that you can actually use the inferrer class from uh, the low light in inferrer class from restorers to actually perform inference on 
uh, uh, these models. Uh, you can uh, either use your weights and biases uh, model checkpoints or you can you know pass the model directly here so you can check out the acknowledgement section here uh, i was primarily inspired by uh, this particular paper uh, low light image and video enhancement uh, using a deep learning survey this was a survey paper by chongi lee uh, who was the author of the original zero dc paper and I would uh, like to take this moment to thank my collaborators who are working with me on Restorers, Saurabh Mahishkar, Samarinda Dash, and Aritra Rai Goshtiputi. So uh, yes, so uh, we are very pleased to uh, share our work with you. Thank you. And I'm uh, free to, uh, you know, you can ask me anything. So it does look like you have a question in the q and It looks like George has a question. Uh, the unsupervised, uh, okay, I'll first read the question. The unsupervised model is cool, but what would be the benefit over just applying the contrast and pixel distribution ops to the images manually? Uh, uh, okay, cool. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, we kind of discussed about uh, traditional auto contrast, uh, you know, the pitfalls of traditional auto contrast, right? Uh, I'll just quickly... you know yeah we kind of uh, discuss the uh, pitfalls of traditional auto contrast algorithms and uh, other than that i'll also say that they do not perform as good as zero dc how uh, let me show you a comparison i did 2 years ago when i first implemented zero dc so i'll take you to keras.io/examples i'll open up the particular uh, and uh, here's the thing when i first implemented, uh, created this particular tutorial for zero DC. Uh, Francois Cholet, who is the creator of Keras uh, on that particular PR thread, uh, performed this particular interesting benchmark. So you can kind of see the, uh, I'll zoom in a bit for you. The, this is the original image, uh, the low light image. This is the result uh, by an auto contrast algorithm, uh, traditional auto contrast algorithm. And this is the result that was, uh, spewed out by zero DC. So you can clearly see that uh, not only that the auto contrast uh, models have their own set of works and stuff like that, they do not actually perform very well. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, it looks like there is another question, although it's in the chat and we may have lost its context, but uh, NTM asks, are the test models from a totally new scene or related or trained data? I don't know if we're... Uh, the test, uh, the models are not being tested on uh, trained data. So if you see the results uh, for evaluation, you can clearly see the distinction that these, these panels show the results on the training data set. And these uh, uh, panels basically show the results on uh, completely new data, uh, which the model hasn't seen at all. Uh, the eval 15 split of the low light data set. And uh, that's the, that's uh, the, these are the numbers we are kind of interested in, in terms of uh, quantitative analysis. And in terms of qualitative analysis, I think, you know, zero DC has uh, already uh, shown that it's uh, capable of holding its own against the larger models like NAFNET or VNET V2. Uh, so, yeah. The, oh, also the images uh, that we uh, show in the uh, usage section are, completely out of distribution images from uh, different data sets. For example, these Im incredibly poorly lit images are from a data set called the dark face uh, data set, which is actually for object detection in incredibly low light conditions. And uh, I have tossed a couple of images from Game of Thrones, which are results of bad cinematography. And, and yeah, like you can see, like, so these are all out of distribution images from uh, other data sets or sources, yes which we are testing the model on. I uh, have uh, uh, basically, uh, since uh, you are kind enough to ask me a few questions, uh, this is my challenge, uh, time to challenge the audience. If you wish, you can uh, you know scan this uh, particular QR code, which you are seeing on the screen right now. Uh, you can scan this QR code to uh, take a small quiz. Uh, the quiz is you know based on uh, uh, the materials from uh, this particular talk. And uh, the top three participants uh, can, uh, you know, win uh, pool weights and biases swags. You can email, uh, uh, you can email me at. Uh, my, I'll, I'll drop my email ID in the chat, 